Right, good morning everybody. My name is Thomas, Thomas Schlacher, and I'm going to take you through an interesting journey today, which is a journey to explain in two hours to you the fundamental concepts of ecology. Now, um, let's have a look what we can do here. Now, this year there is no Tour de France. Um, because of the coronavirus crisis, but I saw if we can't have a tour de France, we can have, as the French people say, a tour de force. And it is a tour de force to really talk you through the fundamental concepts of what ecology is in about two hours or a little bit more or a little bit less. Now, normally this would take an entire course or I would take several subjects However, what is important here, and this is the most fundamental thing to remember, is I designed this lecture around explaining to you some of the core concepts. It's really the conceptual understanding which you need to take away from this particular lecture rather than the details. Now, it doesn't advance, interestingly. Uh, so, what are you going to learn today? Uh, firstly, we're going to talk about how ecology is organized into levels, into different hierarchical levels. Then we talk about a concept which comes across very, very often in your learnings, and it's called the ecological niche. Then we talk how populations grow, how they age, how individuals have different uh, types of survivorship, that's called demography. Then, of course, we get to the choosy subjects of communities and particular community interactions. We talk about the co-evolution, the types of biodefenses. And finally, perhaps most importantly, on a planet which is seeing more and more individuals of humans, uh, we're going to sort of talk about the energy flows in ecosystems, what it actually means for food chains, how ecological pyramids are constructed, and lastly, you know, we talk about scavengers, how important they are. Now, those are the main themes in this lecture, which are, of course, very, very closely related to what I just said. So basically, we kick off with about five slides about ecological complexity and organization. Then we spend quite a bit of time talking about populations. Then we talk about communities, which is an assemblage of different uh, populations in, in the same habitat. And then we discuss some of the most basic, I should say, but pivotal, you know, concepts of ecosystems. Now, the first thing you might actually notice is when you um, basically poke around in the, or rummage around, or ferret around in the ecological literature is that you might have people working on particular organisms, how they relate to the environment and function in it. You might have people working about how, let's say, a population of rabbits or of kangaroos uh, grows and dies and distributes itself. You might have people talking about different communities, but it's quite different to what we mean by human communities because we are only one species. That is, ecological communities are uh, the agglomerations, one could say, the aggregations of different species. Then we talk about ecosystems and, bios and the biosphere as such. So, Essentially, we have an organization which runs from a relative small scale, that being the organism, right up to the entire planet and the living part of the entire planet, I should say. Now, this is in many ways not terribly dissimilar than if you would actually go and study medicine, where you start off with the DNA, then you work yourself up to the cell organelles, like the mitochondria, the nucleus, whatever. Then the cells form tissues and the tissues form bodies. So it's a hierarchically nested structure. What do you mean by nested is there's no bird coming and laying a nest here in the view of population. It basically means organisms are nested in populations, communities are uh, populations are nested in communities and so forth. So that part here, which sits above, is you know part of the next one, and so forth, and so forth. Now in terms of the size structure, you can, as an ecologist, 
do anything from working on how a population of this particular protozoan is called a ciliate grows right up to basically how the biosphere works. So the world literally is your oyster. And I always say to people, do whatever you really are passionate about. But that's my personal preference. So uh, people also talk about the environment. I love this picture of the kangaroo sort of scratching its tummy on a beach. Um, <laughs> looks like Tasmania or something. No, never mind. Um, so the environment of an animal is actually something quite complex because it encompasses a range of abiotic factors such as the space available, the energy forms, you know, whether the weather, the climate, the soil, the air, the water properties, and uh, many other factors. The biotic dimensions of the environment is basically the other competitors, uh, the other individuals, which can be the friends or foes, uh, or even parasites. And then we talk often about resources, and that's basically everything an organism uses in its environment. That may be, in that case, habitat or food, water, and so forth. So the environment for an ecologist is a much more encompassing term than we usually use it in everyday language. So we just met, actually look out into the garden. It's actually a wonderful day here. Uh, and sort of think about um, just, you know, the abiotic environment. Now, and we often also talk about the difference between renewable resources and non-renewable ones. The renewable ones are basically uh, things which grow back, which can regenerate, such as plants, this little uh, chipmunk here, you know, eating uh, some grass, grass grows back. It's a resource which is renewable. Now you see these organisms here competing, those are muscles, those are barnacles, and those are sea stars competing for physically space on a rocky shore. Now, physically space is finite. It doesn't grow, right? The only way you can actually grow is by actually putting artificial reefs into the sea. And we talk about that in the, in the next lecture because uh, our colleague uh, Ben Gilby and myself and Andrew and Chris, we have done quite a bit of that lately. So it is always important to bear in mind when you talk about ecological resources, whether they are in a continual recycling and renewal and growth and turnover, or whether they're basically fixed. You can't actually make any more of it. Now, one of the central goals, I love maps, so you're going to see a lot of maps uh, if you actually take a few of my courses over the next few years, is a central goal of ecology is to understand how organisms are distributed. Essentially, we need to know why a particular individual is in a certain place, how many there are, and how well they are doing, to put it really, really simply. Now, this is a map of the human population, which I actually think is absolutely fascinating. You know, uh, it, it tells so, so many stories. Of course, we're not, you know, particularly surprised that there's few people, you know, in the Sahara, perhaps, you know, uh, for nomadic Durex, uh, pretty much the same thing uh, down here in Southern Africa uh, and in Australia. That doesn't mean there are no people, it's just that the population density is very low because those people lived in accordance to what the land would actually support. Uh, and it also shows us quite fascinatingly that, you know, the white conquest of uh, Australia has really concentrated in the cities here. Although, of course, the tragedies of dispossession and colonization in a most awful way are spread throughout every singular Aboriginal community. Let's not forget that. But essentially, as ecologists, we want to know why and where things are, where are the wild things. And that is important because we need to know where they are in order to conserve them. And that can be at a large scale, as we see here the whole globe, or it can be at a small scale, a few meters. And look at the very, very sharp changes here in distributions between what is around here about the mid tide level to as you actually go up. You know? Dense growth of algae and barnacles and mussels, and then a sharp boundary 
and then going up. So there's obviously some environmental interactions at play here and some biological interactions at play in determining that kind of distribution. So often we also talk, I love this map here, this actually comes from the Lion King and somebody worked out there are the wild things which you can see in uh, the Lion King. However, I just basically put that in here. So you get an idea that distributions change between animals. No animal on the planet has really exactly the same distribution as another species. And we use a term for that uniqueness of space and resources called the niche. Now, essentially, how an individual or a species is distributed amongst the possibilities it has in the natural environment is called its niche. So, most basically, uh, we as humans, we have never sort of lived permanently in Antarctica because our environmental niche, before we actually have very fancy means of actually insulating uh, our bodies and, you know, making, you know, highly technologically advanced, uh, basically containers buried in the snow, is that it actually exceeds our limits of temperature tolerance. Uh, plants do not really grow very well in desert conditions and so forth and so forth. So you might say, well, oh, this is actually not really rocket science, but it's actually very important to bear in mind this fundamental dependency of every organism to live with a set, within a set of conditions uh, which permit it to live and not perish. There's also another principle. What we know from evolution is that in the long term, every species must differ in some way from another species in order to survive in the long run. In evolutionary time, no two species can persist over reasonable time intervals if they do exactly the same thing. Eventually, one will actually outcompete the other one. What this has led to is that adaptations have evolved which pull characters apart. So what we actually see is that, for instance, two birds here, this is actually a gray tit and this is a blue tit, a little birds which feed in spruce trees predominantly in the Northern Hemisphere. They look, look very similar, but they have subtle differences in how they actually feed on a tree, mostly based on the height. So, that has actually been known for quite a while and it has been formulated as the principle called the competitive exclusion principle, which basically says no two species can occupy the same niche if they are to live together in a stable ecological community. Right, and here's an illustration um, how you might, you know, construct and depict, you know, the environmental niche of a particular fish. Now, everybody who has kept uh, fish, and I think uh, if you're going to be a parent, or if you already have been one, or you currently are one, uh, I think very few, uh, uh, just like me, will escape the experience of having an aquarium. And, you know, you learn a lot, you know, because you know, what kids do, things die. And you very quickly figure out that, you know, fish have a very narrow temperature range. They also have a very narrow range of salt content they can tolerate and pH. This is a, those are the factors you need to usually control in an aquarium setting. And it's not different in the wild. And every fish species differs from the next one in, de in the definition of the boundaries here to make up that box, if you will, which is called its environment or ecological niche. Uh, to date that, you know, almost simplistically to the next level, you could actually say, well, you know, species which have a very broad niche, right, are called generalists, and species which have a very narrow niche are called specialists, if you just hear that term. We actually, as ecologists, define it quite, I think, well in terms of conditions and in terms of behavior and in terms of Food items, for instance, uh, and diet press a species can forage on. And here is two uh, basic uh, examples I put out. Probably one of the most generalized species in Australia is this fellow here. It's a called a Duresian grow. I probably have some out my window right here. Uh, 
and they basically follow humans. They exploit a wide range of food resources. They are very, very hardy, so to speak. So they are basically specialists with a broad niche. Then you have an extremely narrow niche, which is the Australian night parrot. I think it hasn't been seen for decades, and only one turned up as a roadkill uh, a few years ago. So they are around, but of course very narrow, and people suspect they have a very, very narrow niche. So that was part one, where we just had a few definitions, really, which you need to remember as you progress through your science degrees. Those things will come up time and time again. And we actually go through them in more detail as time progresses in different courses. Now, part two. Let's talk about populations. And this is very topical, of course, and you will see in the 2.9 minutes uh, why it's very topical, because we're going to talk about population growth and diseases. Now, a population is defined as at least two or more individuals of the same species, such as those butterflies here, you know, uh, aggregating on a tree. Now, I put on Blackboard for you a wonderful resource. If you can't find it there, you can actually download it free from the internet. It's an open, freely accessible, legally freely accessible book. And Charles Elton is really considered as the father of modern animal ecology. I highly recommend reading that. And it's so free. And you don't have to read the whole book in one go. Just sort of, you know, go through chapters or, or pages because many of the ideas Charles Elton expresses here in a very eloquent way, in a very engaging way, are still very, very much uh, alive today. And we have built basically modern ecology based on Charles Elton's seminal work. And um, I actually stayed in the very flat he had at Merton College in Oxford. My very first job interview for a job was at Oxford and I came second. Now I'm Sunshine Coast. Same thing, really. Any case, uh, before we actually get to uh, how populations grow, age, and so forth, uh, I'd like to introduce you to a term called metapopulations and metapopulation dynamics because that is an increasingly important field and also it is one which has an enormous importance for conservation practice. Now, quite often a, a population, the global population, let's say of humans, as we just had it on the map, boom, 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 where are we, here we go, is, well, you know, we got a large population here, probably not so many here, and then another one here, and then another one here, and not so many up here in Siberia, and so forth. So we are scattered, right? That means different parts of, let's say, the human population occupy different geographic areas. So there's one here, and there's one there, and there's one there. Sometimes these are called dams, but never mind too much about it. And those populations exchange individuals. Individuals emigrate from one and they immigrate in another one and so forth, and the, right, uh, and, and the other way around. Now, it becomes really, really important uh, in conservation biology if you have a population in an area which receives more immigrants than it supplies as immigrants uh, to the world at large. We call this a sink. Other populations, they grow rapidly, they produce very, very much, you know, very many immigrants and they supply sinks. Now, in the long run, uh, we focus both on the production of sources because those are the ones from which populations can regenerate. But we also often need to figure out what's happening here in sinks. Why are they not reproducing? Why are they not growing? Why are they not producing, you know, a reasonable number of individuals which can go and distribute themselves to other populations. And the reason quite often is because conditions have been made unfavorable. A classic example now is sandy beaches along the Sunshine Coast in our national parks. Basically, birds which rely on dunes and beaches and the surf zones have become highly threatened because the beach, because of so many four by fours, has become a source. We also call those areas ecological trap because 
species and individuals get trapped there. They try to reproduce, but they never actually get to because the eggs get squashed or, you know, dogs eat them, whatever it may be the case. And so essentially, this is a real problem to identify those ecological traps and do something about it. Now, look at this fellow here. I mean, he looks quite happy, really. He has a bit of a yawn. And I don't think really much of a week goes by in Australia where people don't actually talk about demography. They might not actually call it that way, but we quite often talk about, oh, what population size can we grow to or will we grow to? Uh, do we have too many old folks? Do we have enough young folks? You know, what is it? Are there more females than males? This is actually in some societies a very, very big problem, and so forth, and so forth. So basically working out those dynamics of a population is called demography. And I'm going to step you to a few of the key parameters here because they are super, super important in this crazy world of COVID-19. Now, the first thing we need to recognize is that survivorship in a population of animals is basically a balance between how much you invest in your young and how many you produce. So you can either have a strategy where you say, oh, I produce a few young and I look after them really well and essentially they will grow most of the individuals will grow to ripe old age and then die off of natural causes and this is basically pretty much what we have done as humans in the developed world in first world countries because we have basically mostly through food production and investment heavy investment in medical research and technology uh, you know you know, lowered mortality rates very significantly. And so that gives rise to this kind of uh, pattern, which is quite rare in nature. Some of the long lived animals, let's say maybe elephants or blue whales, can have something approaching this kind of survivorship course. The other extreme is what we call type three is you can say, well, you know, I don't really want to hang around with my kids, they annoy me greatly. What I rather do is uh, I would use lots of little tiny babies and I just hope a few of them will make it. So there's very little parental investment, but by sheer numbers, a few of them will actually make it to reproduce themselves. Classic case is fish who spawn thousands of eggs or turtles. Turtles, marine turtles, despite, you know, uh, you know, humans generally really loving them because of the big eyes. There's actually a, a psychological underpinning for that, uh, is that they lay large clutches of eggs, sometimes two or three in the season, but only a few of the tiny hatchling turtles tragically make it to adulthood and to survive. But the strategy here is zero parental investment. You basically lay the eggs and off you go and you know uh, develop the next clutch. But a few of them will make it. So you basically play the numbers game here. And here you play the survivorship game. And the other one is basically the middle road. And this is what songbirds do uh, when they build a nest and lay eggs into it. So let's be very conscious about the basic decisions which are made here in survivorship course. The other thing is, I know that sounds a bit cruel here, is this is ubiquitous. So in nature, most individuals never actually make it to reproduce. Only a few uh, mammals, mostly, or long-lived birds, make uh, grow to reproductive age and produce a cohort of individuals themselves. And you know, here you see a salmon being caught um, by a grizzly bear up in Alaska. That's a classic example. The salmon they grow up. Uh, basically, they get spawned in fresh water. Then as they are small, they go down the rivers, they you know, live in the sea for a while. When they want to spawn themselves again, they go up the rivers. And they either die after having spawned or being eaten on the way up or on the way down. So they can actually make it once. As humans, we usually basically uh, see one or two cohorts of our genes reproducing. Uh, 
the first one, of course, when we become parents ourselves. And the second one is when we become uh, grandparents. Uh, of course, you can actually become a grand grandparent, you know, but you know, a few of us live that long. But you can actually do it quite easily if you actually start producing very uh, rapidly uh, or at a very young age and you live long. So let's be, you know, conscious of the fact that death is for many animals the norm rather than the exception. Now, you will actually come across those kind of graphs quite often when people talk about demography. And while well, this is a bit of a static display, right? You can actually say, oh, okay, this was the age pyramid of, you know, Mexicans. I don't know why they choose Mexicans. Uh, in a textbook in 1975, and this is basically in 2005, 30 years later, and what we actually see, it has changed quite dramatically. Now, what can we actually read out of uh, one of those demographic uh, displays? Now, here is a wonderful resource, you know, um, let's just open that up here. Uh, you can spend literally hours uh, exploring the demography of the human race on the planet Earth. It's really quite astonishing. I, I, I find it flabbergasting and quite sad, really. Uh, guess the United Nations is not free of, uh, of things you couldn't actually do better, but no organizations, no individualists, but they do a marvelous job and that we actually, or some countries, pondered the possibility or have actually done it. To leave the World Health Organization, this times of crisis is actually quite amazingly uh, ridiculous, I think. Never mind. So let's say you can actually click on this one and we say, right, what do we want to know? Do we want to know? And let's say we want to know, ooh, what's the life expectancy of both sexes around the world? You can go like, ah, we see a clear difference here between the developed and the developing world. And then you can, this is really cool. You can actually, oh, what was it like there when we actually first got the data? And you can see, for instance, look what actually happened in Asia or India uh, in, in, from, from the Arabian or the you know, peninsula down you know, to much of, of Asia. Vast improvements, really, from the 70s onwards, really. And what we can also see is over time, and this is a good thing, really, because they're all humans. Nobody wants to die early is that the world will become a more homogenous place when it comes to how long people are expected to live. But it also means we're going to get a lot more old folks all over the planet. You can actually look at the total fertility rate. No surprises here. Uh, as people become better educated, as they have more access to economic resources, they usually have fewer children. That is also sometimes, remember about the strategies I just told you, if you have very, very bad medical treatment, you have to produce a lot more young because infants unfortunately die. This is a very awful reality, but that's how it actually goes. So you can actually go to that you know, uh, as you want. And if you don't want maps, you can say, right, um, what about graphs? Let's, what is the, come on. Let's say I want to know who, what is the age structure of Australia? Let's have a look, All right? They also group them. I tried to look up Vatican City, but obviously the Pope doesn't actually give out any data on that one, at least on the fertility rates, surprising. So let's see Australia. Let's do a demographic program and we want, let's say, a population pyramid. Ta-da, here it is. Now, the really cool thing is, I think, I, I just love this tool, is you can go, look how it's going to change. What are we going to see? We actually see the population becoming quite fat, quite ungainly. That means we're going to get more and more old, 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 old people. It's going to push up and we're going to lose, you know, the very young ones. And this is why immigration is important to keep the economy afloat. You can literally work this out by simple logic. But what was it, let's say, in 1950? Very different. Of course, it was smaller, but it also had a uh, 
a, a tip and we can actually see and this is very very interesting here you see that that kink in here and this is basically what happened because people didn't you know have that many children during the second world war and also of mortality of soldiers so you can actually see that kind of impact any case so um i just show you a few things you can actually say oh it actually shows me uh, the potential for growth and the potential for growth is usually depicted or you can read that off the graphs here by having lots of young people reaching reproductive age around here so the, the pyramid is fat and then you of course very few of them survive because there's not many old folks around or you can actually go this is western europe and look ba 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 you know it got many old individuals over 60 but what we also see is uh, that's kind of me you see actually the baby boomers coming through i actually tried to go to a, a bar the other day and you have to sign with the covid ad and <laughs> i didn't have my glasses and i'm going to figure it out on my phone and then one of the fellows comes and says, ah let me do it for you bloody baby boomers you know i always can't figure out what's going on on their phones i said thanks mate here we go makes me feel a lot better uh, and then uh, we can also see, you know, post reproduction. This is uh, Oscar Bay came from here and here, or uh, so. So all sort of manners of information can get uh, can be actually uh, read from those population pyramids, and that's very important, of course, for long term politically planning. Now, it is of course. Uh, the next few pictures I have here is to illustrate that we have known something for quite a long time. And this is very, very important of how we view population growth. So what, what have we known? This is a child from uh, the British Isles in a coal mining town up north at the turn of the century. And conditions were absolutely horrifically inhumane. I mean, the poverty, the diseases, and the child mortality, you know, it makes it, you know, it, it, it gives me goosebumps just to think about the horrors of how these people lived. And, and basically, we knew that resources were limited for those people, and that's why infant mortality was so high. But nobody had the moral compass to do much about that. And let's not forget, when we actually are, you know, not having, you know, enough money for the health system, it's just incredibly cruel. Here is a chap running through a swarm of locusts. So we also knew, even the Piper talks about uh, locust swarms. So sometimes organisms reproduce like crazy, absolutely mad, without any apparent upper limit. And of course, a famous example are lemmings, which apparently have uh, population explosions and then they march towards the sea and fall off the cliff and the ones who actually make it and you know, they work as judges so again that there is a reality to that that we actually perceived or have observed population explosions of organisms and they usually come to a halt that usually disappear again and not in only very rare cases do they actually persist for a significant amount of time why is that well uh, let's do a little bit very simple mathematics and I talk you through it without the mathematical terms is if you don't set any limit to population growth and it just say I have just sort of an internal intrinsic regulation the growth the number of animals in a population of individuals just rises exponentially it just shoots up so every population has an intrinsic growth rate called R. Now, remember now the, uh, the whole, uh, when public health officials all over the world say, oh, what we have to actually get down is the R number. It's that intrinsic rate of growth. So it's actually uh, very important to remember. If there is no limit, things just shoot up. And this is called actually exponential growth. So this is this form of growth rate. And basically the equation for that rate of growth is incredibly simple. And it's basically saying that the change in numbers, dn 
uh, over dt, so this is time, change in time, change in numbers, is the intrinsic growth rate times the number of individuals. So that means the more individuals you have, even if the growth rate stays the same, the intrinsic growth rates, the more individuals you have, the faster it will grow, and that's why it, sh it shoots up into the sky. But we actually know that this is really the case because there is a limit to the population growth because eventually uh, a population will run out of space or food and usually both. So we actually call this the carrying capacity of the environment. Now the carrying capacity of the environment is denoted by car, that's just by convention. And all we have to do is to get to the growth rate we normally see, we have the uh, modifying term, uh, which uh, basically means the growth rate approaches zero because k minus n divided by k approaches zero is, and it's multiplied by uh, the exponential growth terms here. So as the population reaches the asymptote, it bends horizontally and it gives it very uh, characteristic sigmoidal growth pattern. And why does it do that? Uh, because populations which grow very fast usually exhaust what we call the limiting resource. That can be anything, but usually it's the resource which is in shortest supply. And the carrying capacity is the maximum number of individuals a particular environment can sustain on average over low times. So a classic example is of course, you know, how the populations of snow hares and lynx fluctuate. This is the bird, this is the prey. And essentially you could say, oh, lynx will actually grow exponentially but not quite because eventually they will actually run out of food. They have killed all the snow hares. And snow hares will basically then uh, recover. Lynx will actually follow and so forth and so forth. And we actually know that because from tax records of the belts of the fur, the bellage, which was actually traded. So what you can actually see is this very, very neat cycle where predator and prey oscillate in units a little bit offset but basically what we actually see is as the snowshoe hair goes up so does the links then basically uh, the snowshoe hair goes down the links take a little bit of time to actually go down and the whole cycle repeats and that lag time we you know, here's a few other examples most populations oscillate they wobble so to speak up and down that common carrying capacity. And why do we get those oscillations? For you know three main reasons. The first one is the carrying capacity of the environment in itself can change over time. Right? So a good illustration of that is you speak to any farmer in Australia and they will actually tell you, oh that was a particularly good year, there was a bumper crop, or this was actually a bad one, and so forth. We actually know that sometimes the land produces more in reality for a wild animal that would mean if there is more vegetation we can actually reproduce more herbivores and so forth. Uh, basically you know many animals particularly the predators experience a lag time between when resources go down it takes them uh, from a population demographic point of view usually a few weeks to months to years to actually also slump but then it also means that the resource recovers earlier, but animals follow and so forth and so forth. And it can also happen that in some instances, and particular diseases are important here, is that the more animals you have, or the more individuals you have, the stronger the disease probability is. And that has something to do because the likelihood of transmission increases with the number of individuals. So sometimes they can actually fall very dramatically below the carrying capacity. Sounds familiar, doesn't it, in those times? Now, this is the world population growth rate, and I just showed you the resource where you can actually uh, uh, 
generate all those sort of maps for yourself. And you might say now, um, what's actually happening? Are we, as a human race, going to exceed the carrying capacity of the planet? Now, nobody can really tell. And the way we, I think, change climate at the moment is very frightening. But basically, nobody knows quite for sure. What we do know, though, is that this is the rate of population change from 2020 to 2025, look at this one. And this is basically at the end of the 21st century. So it will have dramatically slowed down. So we're actually going to grow less, most likely, and we, we model that based on previous human behavior over the next 60 years. That gives actually some reason for hope. And you might say, ooh, so how many people are we going to get? Well, nobody knows for sure, but we can make reasonably good predictions. This is, a, of course, a, a very extreme case, and this is the other very extreme case. COVID is throwing everything out the window now at the moment, but we are, you know, probably still somewhere around this bend. And what it actually means is, well, let's see how many we have got at the moment. It's about eight, and we might get to around, you know, whatever, you know, 10, 10 and a half, 11. Now, that is actually not such a big increase anymore uh, from what we have today. And part of that is explainable that as we empower, and this is a very good thing because every human life which is saved is a, you know, ethically correct decision. Uh, people in less developed countries is a pure, uh, with a, you know, far worse medical system, more and more people will survive. But that also means the more they survive, the better educated they are, they produce fewer children. So growth rate, after all, will, you know, uh, plateau out. Uh, and this is the Australian scenario. I think we go a little bit further up, but this is actually based on continual immigration. And who knows how this is all going to play out now, whether people are still, you know, uh, willing to travel around the world just like we have always done as an immigrant nation, or whether we're going to see very fundamental changes in how we distribute ourselves across the planet. But let's not forget a few uh, simple facts. Uh, I, you know, I leave the interpretation of how we as humans approach carrying capacity entirely up to you, because it is often quite a value judgment. What we have actually known is that the human population has grown almost for millennia or centuries, basically since the Middle Ages, because we became better at producing food. Uh, we had over human history, terrible famines, pestilences, diseases, wars, whatsoever, but usually they only make a little kink in the overall population growth because it is better survivorship through medical advances and mostly producing food much more efficiently. We also have expanded agriculture, which you know, makes even more food. And so basically up to now, we have pretty much been on that logistic, uh, on that exponential population growth. The question then is, will this go on forever? Of course not, because, and, Nobody quite knows what the number is, but by the end of the day, um, you know, there's a finite uh, supply of food and there's also a finite space we can live on. I don't think the second one really matters because you know, we just have to get used to have a greater population density. But we also have to question then, you know, uh, well, is it only a numbers game or is it also a, a, a game of the quality of life? And this is, of course, a very, very different one, because the quality of life is very different to how many people we can possibly theoretically support. So, and this is all dependent on what we actually think religious, in terms of our religion, in terms of our social expectations, in terms of our cultural norms. And we have also shifted those perceptions and ethical standards about the value of human life a lot. In the Middle Ages, people died, you know, by there are millions and you know you could have to say well you know if you were a peasant uh, somewhere you know uh, in the countryside uh, you know your life was probably not 
very much valued, you know, by the landed gentry. And luckily we have moved away from that. So the quality of life will actually become, I think, the determining factor of how we see human capacity into the future. We, in terms of population regulation, we often then uh, think about uh, those factors as some being density dependent factors and some being density independent factors. Now a classic example are global pandemics. They actually rage through the population much quicker and they ravage it much more severely in cases where densities are high. Remember the gross equation, it's all about the N, right? So that actually means uh, that if densities are high, you know, there will be you know, a greater disease burden, there will be more parasites, but also there will be more competition, right? That is the same for animals as it is for humans. So quite often, you know, uh, that means that when the density then falls, those factors become less important, right? The other ones are what we call extrinsic factors to population growth. And here is a classic example. That's a, you know, hurricane, you know, uh, I think from in the Caribbean and actually going up over Cuba. So we often think about, you know, storms, fires, and so forth. Of course, they're absolutely terrible. But yes, they kill much wildlife. But in the, in the long run, they usually do not effectively regulate populations unless they occur very frequently and are very, very severe. But by and large, over, over centuries, they make a little kink and then things carry on. And it's really the density dependent biological factors which are much more important. Right, that should actually read communities. I don't know why I didn't change that, but so we go. <laughs> <laughs> into the next section, which uh, where we talk about aggregations of uh, animals of different species, such as here we, and their interactions. Look at this sort of uh, kingfisher going down on, on a perch. It's fantastic, isn't it? Um, so, uh, ecologists use a funny uh, shorthand system really to denote the multiple uh, the, the multiple forms of how species and individuals can interact in ecological communities. We give it a plus when we say it has a positive effect on a particular species and we give it a negative a minus when it has a negative effect and so when we got a neutral one. Now you play out all the different combinations of interactions which we see in nature and this is more or less the system as I have basically been able to couple it together. So that's my own doing. So if we have the classic predator-prey relationship where the predator, you know, benefits from eating, let's say the lion benefits. Oh, look at all the dick swallows, flies, I only see them now. I, I, I just, I mean, that must have happened in the sleep. That's why I selected this picture. Can you see that it's actually a spider web in here? Very weird. Um, so, uh, and then the prey, of course, uh, gets a negative uh, uh, denotion because it dies. Herbivory is the same thing really as uh, predator prey, except that we're talking about a herbivore and we're talking about grass or a tree or whatever. Parasitism, same thing, the parasite benefits and usually the host is not really all that happy. Uh, about having uh, a parasite. We talk about commensalism, where it's basically one species derives the benefit, the other one doesn't really care either way. Classic example is, you know, cleaner fish hanging out, hanging around, uh, you know, sharks and so forth, but, you know, it always blends a little bit in. Competition, usually both species uh, are worse off, and the mentalism is where one is worse off and the other one doesn't really care. So let's have a look. Uh, and before we get into those uh, community interactions, I should say two things. The first one is none of those uh, interaction types occurs in isolation by itself 
in an ecological community. Usually it's a wild mix of just about all of them under the sun. Under the sun. And that actually means that ecological communities uh, function in very, very complex way. And that complexity comes about because so many of those interactions between different species pairs are present. The other thing is, uh, in the Middle Ages, you know, the concept arose of guilds. And guilds were, let's say, the goldsmiths or the cobblers or the carpenters. And so all the you know, male members, unfortunately, this time only males, uh, formed uh, basically brotherhoods to protect their trade. So they did more or less the same thing, you know, in terms of their profession. Now, we can actually also think of species as a profession or as a trade or being an artisan. And that means we group under guilds all the species which use the same class of resources in a similar way. And the trick here is the word similar. Similar because uh, they can never actually use them in exactly the same way because they would be over time you know, excluding each other. And here's a famous example of, let's say, the guild of small insectivorous passerine birds in a forest. They actually look really all very, very similar and they've got some very similar beak sizes, but they feed at different times. They feed on slightly different prey items and they feed on slightly different heights in the tree but basically they're all insectivorous birds. So we call them the guild of insectivore small songbirds. And this is a classic study by MacArthur and Wilson that actually shows how competition for a limiting resource is being limited by species in the same area who at first glance all seem to do exactly the same thing share that resource or use that resource in a slightly different way, right? So what evolution has tried to do is to reduce the overlap in niches. We rather actually pull species apart, be that in terms of behavior, morphology, diet, or whatever it may be. And we actually call, you know, this, you know, pulling apart of, uh, of characters, character displacement. A classic example here is uh, when this chap here, Geospitia and Geospitia fulginosa and Fortis, when they occur at different islands, i.e. not together, the distribution or the size of the bills is more or less the same. Look at this one and that one, I mean, not much in between them. However, if they occur on the same island, then their bill sizes diverge, they move apart, they get displaced. And that displacement facilitates sharing or using the same resource or slightly different resources. And it basically prevents competitive exclusion from running its course. And here is something else. Today, you might go and do a study and measure all the different uh, bill shapes, sizes, and behaviors of the classic example are always the finches on the Galapagos Islands. And you would actually come up with something where you say, hey, yeah, look at this. Um, they're all so well adapted and they're all so different. Surely they can't compete. And usually they don't actually compete terribly strongly because they have different characters but in the past they would have and evolution uh, worked in a way to differentiate the species to distinguish them to make them all different they're all basically all species are parts of a rainbow nation so we call this the, the ghost of competition past because we cannot actually conclude nowadays that competition doesn't happen. We just can't see it anymore, but it always happens as an evolutionary force. So the other thing is uh, about mimicry. Uh, and essentially, what can actually happen is that different um, 
different species or prey species can start to uh, having colorations and body forms that very, very fundamentally uh, change the whole tussle between predators and prey. Now, let's have, you know, a Right, let's have a look at some of the really quite amazing uh, interactions and how, what they mean in terms of community consequences. I love this picture here. Uh, uh, I don't know how they actually took this shot. And it's actually a wasp and it killed a fly and it's actually carrying it away. And wasps are not very big, maybe this one. I mean, no, that's predation. And also, it's a, it's a marvelous uh, example of quotation, but it also is a marvelous example of what we actually going to discuss, and it's warning coloration. Wasps are brightly colored because they go like, oh, don't mess with me, I'm going to sting you. Um, and of course, you know, when we think about predators, we often think about uh, snappy things like this in various uh, guises. And the language is often a little bit human centered, but it's called, you know, ecological warfare. But basically, prey and predator throughout their uh, shared evolutionary time will always try to outsmart each other. And that's called co evolution. The prey might actually get better to hide, and the predator might be actually getting better to actually find it, and so forth, and so forth. However, no prey must ever actually win this race because otherwise the predator would actually go extinct. And so most predators uh, feed on more than one prey species. Otherwise, you know, one prey species could just, evolutionary speaking, outsmart the predator. And or basically it also means that most prey species never quite outsmart the predators and so most of them die and cannot basically swamp the communities. Now, a very, very simple, well, not, I shouldn't say simple, but the first line of defense, and I remember when I had to go to the army, the first three weeks, really, in, in basic training, you spend about, ooh, how can we hide? And I thought, this is actually all rather fun, you know? And then winter came, and it wasn't actually much fun, but never mind. So camouflage, what, what we call mimicry, you know, trying to be cryptic is, you know, one of the first strategies. Look at this transparent fish here. You know, of course, when it's in the water, you know, very much harder to see. This here is a frog sitting on a sum. I mean, how cute is that? But look at the mimicry. It's absolutely astonishing, I think, that animals have actually been able to actually camouflage that well. Uh, that's maybe a behavioral mimicry, I should say. It's a crocodile emerging from the mud here. It's the monster from the mud. And uh, maybe that didn't really work all that well, you know, for the sheep here. Yes, sheep are not necessarily the smartest animals, but that's right. They're, they're getting a, a, a red hot shot. Uh, so essentially, in terms of the coloration, you know, we distinguish between four different types. Uh, cryptic defense is basically, you know, match their backgrounds. And, and so the predator has less of a probability to find the prey. Simple, but very effective. You can also be poisonous. But being poisonous doesn't really help you terribly much if you actually kill the predator after he basically ingested you. So you actually want to tell the predator, look, mate, just to don't go there. Right? I am no good for you. Now, uh, you know, of course, that many frogs, particularly those in the Amazonian rainforest, are highly toxic. And when they have actually amongst the most uh, potent neurotoxins, which, you know, basically block your ner nerves and then you basically, you know, your lungs don't work anymore and that's more or less the end of you. And so they advertise this to the toxicity very, very prominently. Because it's no good being toxic and the predator only finds out after he has eaten you because you're dead. 
And you, you might say, oh, you know, what I should actually do is, you know, uh, I don't really want to produce all those toxins because they can harm me as well. And it's energetically complicated. But what I can actually do is I basically pretend I'm toxic. So species have evolved uh, coloration patterns where they uh, resemble a toxic species. That's called Batesian mimicry. Or often a more amazing case is that you say, right, you know, toxic species A looks very similar to toxic species B. And you might say, if I'm already toxic, you know, why do I want to look like somebody else? Well, the advantage is a predator only has to encounter one of those two, and that's easier for them to learn, and then won't actually touch the second species as well. So it's really actually great for the prey. Here is a concept which has been around for a long time, and I just introduced it to you so you actually know when you stumble across it, what it means, and it's called the keystone species. Now, a keystone species is a particular species which is far more important in structuring the uh, community than the abundance of biomass would suggest. So they are disproportionately more important in setting the distribution, the abundance, the diversity. My neck boys are going, guys, uh, 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 I, I haven't fed the make post this morning, so here we go. Uh, basically, uh, they are more important than the abundance would suggest. Here's a classic example. When you go to Rocky Shores in North America, and uh, the classic literature example comes from there, so I'm using it here is you got black mustards here with barnacles and a little bit of, uh, you know, red and green algae. And you got this massive big sea star, it's called disaster. Now, what that sea star does, it actually feeds on mussels. It actually grows over them, brides them off the rock and yeah, munches them up. They got actually quite powerful chores. And what actually happens to the action of the sea star is it keeps the mussels in check because otherwise, the entire shore would just be covered by one or a few species. So this actually has given rise to this kind of famous example where uh, basically if you have a rocky shore here, which has like algae and barnacles and goose barnacles and black mussels, uh, all basically muddled together and a few sea stars, right? It's a reasonably diverse community. Of course, it's much more yeah, diverse than depicted here. If you actually take all the sea stars out, and this has been done in an experiment, and lo and behold, it didn't take very much uh, long, and didn't take a very long time, they essentially the mussels expanded and covered the entire seashore. So the diversity of the community is lower, right, because the competitive dominant will just swamp everything else, and predators keep that in check. And when it's usually one or two predators, which have an enormously large influence on how the rest of the community is structured, we call it a keystone species or a keystone predator. You can achieve the very much same thing to prevent competitive exclusion of somebody very, very powerful of some species by natural disturbances. Now, and this has been around for a very, very long time time and it's called the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. The basic idea here really is that if we have a community which just moses along very, very nicely in a very benign environment, eventually a few species will dominate everything, leading to an overall low diversity. That basically means on this side here of those graphs, right, if you have you know, low, diver low disturbance, and it can take any form, it can be a hurricane, it can be human trampling, it can be livestock, it can be uh, trees falling in a forest, the species richness is, oops, species richness is low. If you have very excessive disturbance, lots of storms, or lots of livestock grazing in a particular block, that diversity is also low because essentially many species will go locally extinct because they can't you know, handle those severe conditions. So it's usually like the Goldilocks principle, somewhere in the middle, the disturbance is not too harsh and it's not too 
mild where you have where you see the greatest species diversity the idea was originally uh, uh, published by joseph connell who actually noticed that in tropical rainforests storms top lower the big trees and those clearings give the plants which are normally only sitting and so dying in the undergrowth because it's all terribly shady a chance to grow and have a habitat free of the dominant combatants. So what you actually want is this mosaic really of disturbed patches and undisturbed ones, which gives you in some the greatest diversity. We also know now that for instance, uh, sand dunes on coastal, uh, in the coastal zones, uh, landwards of sandy beaches, the greatest diversity and stability you actually get when you don't have too many plants on them. So all this, you know, coastal, uh, tune planting is sometimes a bit of a, an odd one, I should say, because they are systems which have evolved really as malleable ones, as changeable ones, being basically shaped by disturbance events. And somehow we as humans come along and say, oh, I've got a house here in the back, so I better put another 5,000 plants in here. No, well, don't, because what we actually have landed up with is that our sentience are so chock-a-block full of plants because we are not willing to accept that they have bare batches, which is the perfectly natural conditions. But don't get me started on that one. Uh, so here is a really cool one. Um, I, you know, uh, I have often joked, I mean, how would it be, you know, to have a parasite to do a self experiment? And the parasite host uh, relationships have been explored by evolutionary biologist for very, very uh, many decades. And of course, one of the uh, course coordinators, the chief coordinator, you know, uh, Dr. Renfrew, uh, Shao is of course a world expert in parasites. So I probably shouldn't really say too much about that because you will hear lots about that. But what is really uh, interesting here, it's actually a fine balance because not all parasites should ultimately kill the host. They will eventually, but they should actually keep the host alive for a good deal of time, at least until they reproduce, uh, and so they can actually feed off him. And you might have actually seen the Michael Mosley documentaries, uh, I think they're on SBS, uh, on all sort of medical uh, matters. I think they're quite entertaining. But he also did something crazy. You know, he basically said, Ooh, you know, I'm going to swallow some tapeworm eggs. And then he had himself monitored for a few weeks and see how the tapeworm is growing inside him. And they basically put a little endoscopic uh, camera down his, his throat. And this is what a tapeworm looks like if you do a self experiment. People also grow little parasites on their heads. And uh, oddly enough, um, my partner is strictly against that. I'm, I'm, I'm quite keen for that, really, you know. But let's have a look at the... Okay, so we're just at the start of the small intestine. And we can just about see, this is the first glimpse of, of one of the completely full of eggs. And will eventually detach from the worm and pass out in the faecal material. And, and that's how the animal reproduces. Okay, so here's the very end of that worm. This is the last segment which has been produced. Uh, they would have started off as very small segments near the neck of, of the, the parasite. And as the, the parasite gets older, they become further, further back. And of course, they become more mature, bigger. The, 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 the oldest up, ones which are, 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 are curved in the intestine. Room. And of course, we... Okay, as we move further down the intestine, we come across the uh, second of the two tapeworms. And it's quite interesting to, to note that the position of these worms, they're not exactly together. They're spaced out along the intestine, so they're sort of avoiding each other to some extent and, and finding a different... Right. I mean, how fantastic, how fantastic is this, you know? The boys, you know, being scared by a dinosaur cactus. Right. Last but not least, and this is the largest uh, unit of organization we're going to cover in uh, this very short primer on uh, ecology, are uh, ecosystems. Um, I, I still love that kind of cactus. I wonder where it is. Never mind. So an ecosystem is basically you take 
communities which are uh, several populations and their habitats and then you pile a few different communities into a geographic region and that gives you an ecosystem. Now the most you know, noticeable thing about ecosystem is that animals in an ecosystem feed on different things. They also produce biomass in, at different rates and in different qualities. And I don't think anybody has gone through school or any biology class without seeing any of those uh, food web diagrams. However, what really, really amazes me, and I think, you know, you better do well to actually learn those terms is, you know, we have 38 college students and they still don't actually know what a primary producer is or a decomposer. So very, very basically, we talk about primary producers being plants or algae. And essentially they do the phytosynthesis thing and they convert uh, CO2, water, and the energy in light photons into organic molecules. Primary producer equals plants. Then the first level is the herbivores. It's basically things, animals, which eat plants, vegetarians, in other words. And then it goes up to uh, various carnivores, and then essentially you got the top carnivores. But right at the bottom, and we actually finish this you know, lecture, is much of that vegetation and many food webs never ever include that and that's why i actually have it in here and this is one of the prime textbooks is much vegetation matter never gets chomped by herbivores it dies and falls to the ground this is how you make new soils by you know having a mulch garden or a mulch box and essentially it gets you know decomposed by bacteria and fungi many animals many more animals die from other causes than a predator and scavengers eat the carcasses so this is perhaps the most critical component in ecosystems and we're actually moving to a very new fresh and i think quite exciting understanding of scavenger biology when it comes to ecological productivity i need to clear up a few uh, things here because there is a lot of misunderstanding out there. Now, when you grow tomatoes or tahinis or mushrooms or don't grow magic mushrooms, the police doesn't like that, uh, or pumpkins, or you grow chickens, it doesn't really matter. Whatever you try to grow is you want to actually make a new biomass either in the form of tomatoes or chickens or pigs or whatever. And you want to actually do this very, very efficiently, right? However, there is a difference between what the plant or the animal can potentially make and what it does in reality. Why? Because every one of us, as I sit here and bramble away and you probably, you know, lean back on the couch and, you know, have a hot Milo, Watching it, uh, we use energy just to be uh, alive, just to keep our cells alive. We also use energy by waving our arms or by wandering around for movement. So essentially, that energy expenditure is called respiration. It's a little bit of an unfortunate term because respiration also uh, refers to you know ventilating the lungs or gills or tracheas and i actually prefer the term ventilation for that but never mind so that energy expenditure which cannot be avoided is called respiration so the net productivity is basically what you have initially right produced as new tissue minus what you have to expend for keeping yourself alive and moving around. And so that net productivity can be used basically for two different things, right? You can either make new biomass, right? And grow, or you produce new gametes, eggs and sperm, uh, or you move around and that's about it. So what we want to do, of course, in an ideal production system is make sure most of the energy let's say i take in as food or your chickens take in food 
gets converted into flesh. I mean, I think chickens are kind of cute, actually, you know, really, sort of, never mind. Uh, so, uh, essentially, that respiration thing is a bit of a devil here in uh, our desire to produce living tissue. It's a real spanner in the work. Now, how much of a spanner in the works of productivity is it? Well, it's a massive one. As a matter of fact, we lose, on average, 90% of all the energy assimilated or captured as light energy from the sun as heat for metabolic purposes. Ultimately, it will dissipate as heat, but basically for metabolism. And only 10% gets stored as new biomass. Now, that's actually a horribly awful conversion ratio. Our conversion ratio is 0.1. But that also means that only 10% of the energy, let's say, contained in a herbivore gets passed onto the carnivore and then the carnivore and so forth. So every step in a food web or in a production chain loses 90% of the energy you put in. And that is a huge limit to our ecological productivity, which we can uh, basically uh, produce. You might then say, ha, huh, if this actually doesn't really work that well on land, you know, because, you know, raising chickens is reasonably effective, but basically eating anything which is a carnivore is absolutely terrible, really, because you lose a lot of energy as it moves through the system. You might say, oh, and this has been suggested all the time. Uh, and being a marine biologist, I can probably intelligently talk about that is people say, no, 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 what we should actually do is the oceans will actually produce food for the growing human population if we can't actually do it with, you know, animal production. Well, really, you should actually eat vegetables, but let's, uh, let's assume you want animal protein. Well, the oceans are large. They cover about two-thirds of the planet, but there's a problem. Now, blue areas here uh, denote areas literally of blue water, and then it goes up to greenish and red. And those are areas where there's lots of algae material floating in the water. So they're more productive. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist or a spatial analyst to observe that, yes, the ocean is very large, but productivity is in much of the open ocean very low. That's why the water is blue. Because nutrients which fuel plant, plant growth are not available there because they're either far from land or no deep water, which contains nutrients which have been uh, freed by rotting animals falling through the water column, uh, doesn't well to the surface. So we actually call those the blue deserts of the oceans. So that's a bummer. As a matter of fact, you know, productivity is only high in. Look, look at our place, really not terribly high. It's only high really where big rivers come out or in shallow seas, often also in enclosed seas, but much of the ocean has very low productivity. The other problem we have with seafood as feeding the human population is that we eat the wrong fish. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, people say, oh, you should actually go out and fish, and there's plenty of fish in the sea, uh, but is there really? Well, we already know there is low productivity, but we also do something quite terrible. Let's say uh, uh, here is a you know, basket of sardines coming up on deck of a Perth Saint roller. And you say, so, ooh, sardines, uh, I'm not such a great fan of sardines. I really like things like that. I might actually eat a kingfish here or even a, uh, a swordfish. Ooh, why, why the hell does this thing come up here? Okay, yes. Or you might say, hmm, should I really eat those little things like sardines? Well, of course, that's a matter of taste first and foremost. But it's also a matter of being informed properly as an ecologist, what is actually the better solution for the planet? What do I mean by that? Quite simple. If we use uh, the term 
uh, what we have learned now that only 10% of energy is converted into biomass, i.e. flesh in a sardine or in a swordfish, then we can actually do a very, very simple uh, uh, calculation. What I have basically worked out here, I put a random number in here, let's say uh, uh, 500 joules of energy are available uh, in phytoplankton. They produce it as primary producers. 10% of them goes on to zooplankton, which are little crustaceans eating the phytoplankton algae. 10% of them goes on to sardines, da da. Then the sardines might be eaten by a mackerel. 10% goes on to here. And the mackerel might be eaten by a swordfish. So a swordfish steak comes from trophic level number five. That means that 99% of the energy, uh, 99, uh, well, you know, 99.9%, .9%, almost all the energy originally fixed during photosynthesis by phytoplankton has been lost from the system. So it's an incredibly wasteful way to go about it. Sardines, you, you, you still do actually not terribly better. You should actually really eat phytoplankton or zooplankton, but you know, that's maybe one step too far. So what I actually say is that uh, veggies and sardines rule, and very few people know about that. There are consumer initiatives uh, now if it, which basically say, well, we should really eat what we traditionally, uh, at least in Anglo-Saxon countries, considered the rubbish fish. But actually, I think they are delicious and they're actually also much better for you because, of course, game fish accumulate a lot of heavy metals as well. But simple energetics, that simple energetics that every organism is very bad in converting the food it takes in into uh, new biomass, which is flesh, which is basically what we harvest, uh, tells us there are huge ecological losses. Now, um, where is the last thing? Bit odd. So what uh, we basically can also do here, I, sh I showed you, you know, Charles Elton, which is, and also, you know, made the book of his available to you. And, you know, one of the ways we can actually uh, depict uh, how biomass numbers or energy is distributed in ecological systems at different levels of the food chain, we can either tally up, you know, the number of organisms at each trophic level, they're called Eltonian pyramids or pyramids of abundance. We can either weigh all the organisms in each trophic level and tally them up, they're called the pyramid of biomass, those can actually be inverted sometimes. For instance, if you look at a, a system like in the English Channel, which is you know, basically fueled by phytoplankton, how come we have fewer plants than we have animals? Well, the answer is simple, really. The plants turn over very, very rapidly. And so they produce a lot of energy, but they don't need a lot of biomass to actually do that. So the best way to most accurately depict the flow of energy so ecological systems is something what we call the pyramid of energy. Now, this is actually not such a bad diagram, even though it looks very, you know, simplistic, but it tells us an important distinction between two different pathways. The first one is about organic material. Energy comes in here, plants respire, then we have a little bit available, you know, to feed all the little animals, like this is a looks like a springbok and uh, part of it goes into the soil and uh, all the animals will spire and eventually you know the carnivores will die will die so everything basically in an ecosystem dies nothing lives forever that actually means that this part here the decomposers has an extraordinary important role and oddly enough most of the traditional food webs don't really depict it there's two interesting observations you can actually make from this diagram the first one is the action of the decomposers is absolutely critical 
and returning the nutrients back to the soil or the water. So basically when bodies rot, all our basic molecules and elements return nitrogen, phosphorus, iron, sulfur, you name it. And then eventually it can be taken up by both terrestrial and marine plants again. Without the action of this decomposition process, essentially the biosphere would have come to a crunching halt or would be an extremely barren place. The other thing which is actually very interesting is that ultimately all organic matter rots. And when stuff rots, it gives off what a organisms which uh, break it down and metabolize it, give off CO2. So the whole idea of saying, ooh, you know, we can actually combat the ills of climate change by sequestering CO2 and turning it into trees is maybe a little bit short-sighted. It works in the short run. Yes, the trees will actually absorb CO2 and form it and convert it into living biomass. Great. But trees also respire and they give off CO2. On balance, they actually produce you know, more oxygen than they consume, but they actually give off CO2. But no trees live forever. Yes, in our human lifetime, we might actually capture a little bit of CO2 with forests, but eventually it will either be eaten or it falls to the ground. And when it decomposes, all that CO2, which we initially captured, will actually go back into the atmosphere. So it is a stopgap band-aid solution, but it's not going to be a long-term solution. We have to be very careful about that. It's simple, what we call stoichiometry, which is the science of the flow of elements through the biosphere. Now, everything eventually dies and rots. And, you know, those delicious strawberries don't actually look that, you know, delicious anymore. And, but I put them in here because they got bacteria on them and fungi. And they basically break that organic material down. The biosphere is surprisingly full of animal cadavers, carcasses. And the totality, I should say, all of the dead animals, you know, uh, in the biosphere is called carrion. So we talk about, you know, fish carrion or a whale carrion or a seal carrion. Uh, and what mo most people don't realize is most animals die from causes other than predators, either disease or they run out of food or they injure themselves. And so more energy flows through the pathways of carrion, dead carcasses of animals, or carcasses, I should say, or cadavers of animals, to scavengers and decomposers, then it flows through predators. Yes, our world view, when you watch too much David Attenborough, is all dominated by spectacular predators. And I like predators just as the next person. However, A, most predators are actually feeding mostly as scavengers because it's easier. You don't injure yourself and there's lots of dead bodies around. And B, uh, there is uh, much to be gained in terms of energetic pathways from not having to expand energy, hunting these things down, but rather actually looking for it. So, in the end, you could almost say that ecology can be quite a rotten business. And uh, I know I've been told uh, not to tell any of my jokes, but I just can't help myself because that's actually one of my uh, originals ones. So when a vulture goes on a commercial flight, you know, it's Virgin or Qantas, what type of luggage do vultures take on a flight? Carry on. Haha. <laughs> right. And on that, you know, humoristic bombshell uh, and the realization that ecology is a rotten business, but nevertheless, nevertheless a very, very fascinating one. Uh, that concludes our lecture for today. So thank you very much. And we see you uh, in a week's time for the next part.
Thank you.